All right, let's work some problems with relativity. First off, the world's longest burp was 73.057 seconds long. <clears throat> How long would we have measured the burp to be if the person burping was on a spaceship traveling at 0.35 times the speed of light relative to us? All right, as the title indicated, if you haven't figured it out, this is a time dilation problem. So uh, the person burping is going to measure the proper time. They start burping and they end burping, and both of those events happen at the same location. Therefore, the 73.05 seconds, that's the proper time for the time between those two events. All right, if we are on the Earth watching the spaceship fly by, we are going to measure a time dilated time uh, for the time between those two events. The burping starting, the burping ending. All right, so the time dilation equation is delta t is equal to gamma delta t proper, right? We derived that in the video. And as you'll recall, gamma is just one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. So then we just plug in numbers and here we go. So this is gonna be one over the square root of one minus v is 3.5 times the speed of light. So v divided by c is just 0.35. So this is just going to be 0.35 squared and then we multiply that by 73.057 seconds. And what is that going to give us? Well, um, if we go to Python, we just plug things in, it's gonna be 73.057 seconds divided by one minus 0.35 raised to the second power, the whole thing raised to the 0.5 power to take the square root, and we get 78.0 seconds to three significant digits. All right, so there's the answer. So why is this important? It means that if you are working for the Guinness Book of World Records, you need to take relativity into account when you record how long somebody is burping. All right, length contraction. When a plane flies by at 646 meters per second, we measure the length of the plane to be exactly 17 meters long. How much different is the length of the plane as measured by someone on board? indicate whether the length measured on board is shorter or longer than 17 meters. All right, who measures the proper length of the plane? Us or the person on the plane? Well, remember, to measure the proper length, we need to be in a reference frame where the object we're measuring is not moving. In our reference frame, the plane is moving. But in the reference frame of someone sitting on board the plane, the plane is not moving, it's the Earth that's moving, right? So in their reference frame, when they measure the plane, they're going to measure the proper length of the plane, whereas we measure the length contracted length of the plane. So that means that we measure a shorter length than them. So the person on board the plane, when they measure, they're going to measure a longer length than what we measured, longer than the 17 meters. How much longer? Well, let's figure this out. So the equation for length contraction is L is equal to one over gamma L proper. We're trying to find L proper. We're given the length measured uh, by us in the, in the reference frame that's moving with respect to the plane, right? So we just need to solve this for L proper, and that's just gonna be gamma L, all right, which is uh, one over the square root of one minus V squared over C squared times the length of the plane as measured by us on the ground in the reference frame which is not moving with the plane all right but if we just plug things in we're going to have a problem if you plug this into your calculator v is really small compared to the speed of light 464 meters per second is pretty fast it's faster than the speed of sound but it's way slower than the speed of light so probably if you just try and work this problem by plugging things in your calculator is going to take one minus this and it's just going to give you zero. Or rather, it's going to give you just one, all right? This is going to be insignificant compared to the one. So we need to use some math tricks to be able to find the difference in the two length measurements uh, without confounding our calculators. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a Taylor expansion. Hopefully you remember Taylor expansions for math. But the idea with the Taylor expansion is you can write some function of x as just the sum of the nth derivative evaluated at zero times uh, x to the nth power divided by n factorial. In other words, I can write this function as 
the function evaluated at zero plus x times the function the first derivative evaluated at zero plus x squared over two times the function second derivative evaluated at zero plus x cubed over three factorial times the third derivative evaluated at zero and so forth. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use a Taylor expansion to make an approximation so that we can get this problem. All right. So the idea is we have something that's very small. Imagine that x is very small. If x is really small, then x squared is extremely small, and x cubed is fantastically small. So we're going to throw out all of these things with higher powers of x and just use that right there. And we're going to say that f for small values of x is approximately equal to f evaluated at 0 plus x times its derivative evaluated at 0. All right, so what is f of x going to be for us? Well. Let's consider f of x to be uh, 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Uh, let's call it that, all right? And then v over c squared is what we'll plug in for x, all right? It's easier if this is just x. I can write this as 1 minus x to the negative 1 half power. How's that, all right? So the de first derivative of f, I just bring down the minus 1 half, and then I have my 1 minus x, right? And then uh, my power is going to go down by 1, right? So it's going to be negative 3 halves. And then I take the derivative of what's inside, and that gives me uh, a minus sign. All right? So there's the first derivative of that. Any questions? All right. So now I'm going to approximate this. So I'm going to 1 over the square root of 1 minus x is going to be approximately equal to this evaluated at x equals 0. If I evaluate this at x equals 0, I just get 1. Plus x times the first derivative evaluated at 0. If I evaluate this at 0, what do I get? If x is equal to 0, I'm just going to get 1 half. All right, so there we go. So this is approximately equal to 1 plus 1 half x. Or in other words, 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared is about equal to 1 plus 1 half v squared over c squared. All right, so now um, L proper is just going to be this times L. All right, so we ought to be able to find this now. L proper is going to be equal to, approximately equal to, 1 plus 1 half v squared over c squared, all times L. But what we wanted was not L proper. We wanted to find out how much bigger L proper was than L, how much bigger the measurement in the plane was than on the ground. So I'll just take L proper minus L. And if I subtract L from both sides, it will get rid of that 1. And we're just left with 1 half V squared over C squared times L. All right, so that's going to be 1 half 400, was it 464, I believe it was, over the speed of light, 2.9979 times 10 to the 8. The meters per second cancels out on these, so I'll just drop them, and then I have 17 meters. So how much bigger is the plane as measured by somebody in the plane? It's going to be 0 0.5 times 464 times 17 divided by 2.9979 times 10 to the 8. It's going to be 1.32 times 10 to the minus 5 meters. 1.32 times 10 to the minus 5 meters. All right, um, or about 13.2 uh, micrometers, 13.2 microns. All right, so that's why we didn't notice relativity in the past. A 17 meter long airplane traveling faster than the speed of sound gets length contracted by a few microns is all. All right, but it's real and it happens. And there are other, you know, we talk to astronomers, things moving really fast in space, things happening in uh, particle colliders, these things really matter. Okay, now for a more complicated time dilation problem. I place a clock on a jet airplane. It travels around the globe at 464 meters per second, returning exactly 24 hours later, as measured by someone at rest with respect to the Earth. How long did the time for this journey differ from 24 hours as measured by someone on board the plane? Indicate whether it was longer or shorter than 24 hours. So is it, going to be a, is it going to last longer or shorter for someone on the plane? And how much? How do we solve this problem? Well, the basic equation that we're going to use is, that, is our time dilation equation, right? But if you don't think about this carefully, you'll work this backwards. 
Remember that the pilot isn't in an inertial frame. He goes out and he comes back. So while his velocity magnitude is constant, the direction is changing. So he is not in an inertial frame. She's not in an inertial frame. So we have to do everything in the person on the ground's reference frame. So this is like the twin paradox where we have to do everything in ghost loads reference frame. Okay, the person on the ground observes the two events, the plane leaving and the plane arriving, occur at the same place. So technically speaking, the person on the ground measures the proper time for the two events. But um, don't let this confuse you because we're going to do the exact opposite in a minute and here's why. We can't just use the time dilation equation to transform that time into the pilot's frame because the pilot isn't in an inertial frame. We're going to have to do something else. So what we're going to do then is uh, the, we're gonna, the problem is going to end up being the exact opposite of what you might have initially thought. We're going to do everything from the Earth observer's frame, not from the pilot's frame. We know how long the time lasts in the Earth observer's frame. Now we need to see how does the Earth observer observe time passing, the, the watch ticking on the pilot's arm. Okay, so the Earth observer will notice that the pilot's watch is ticking slower than his, right? Why? Because the Earth observer measures the proper time for the total trip, but we're going to take something smaller, all right? Our pilot's flying along. We want to measure something about her that's much shorter than the total trip so that we can kind of do it before she changes into another reference frame, if that sort of makes sense. So let's look at a tick on her watch. To the pilot, the tick will last one second, but to the observer on the ground, it's going to last longer than one second. Why longer? because the pilot measures the proper time for the second hand doing ticks on their watch, right? The second hand is here, the second hand moves here. Um, those two events happen in the same place in the pilot's reference frame because the watch is on the pilot's arm. This is measuring what the pilot of the plane measures as time evolving, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say, look, the ticks, when, we, when the observer on the ground observes the pilot's watch, they will observe their watch running slowly. So they're going to conclude, ah, time is passing more slowly for the pilot. They're going to measure a smaller time for the trip. Okay, so the pilot's watch will make fewer ticks during the trip. So it is the pilot that will measure the shorter time. All right, fewer ticks on the watch means shorter time. All right, so how are we going to work this? Well, um, the simple thing would be to just write down the equation delta t is equal to gamma delta t proper, and then say, oh, um, things are going to scale as if the pilot were measuring the proper frame, and so we're going to get a longer time for us and a shorter time for the pilot. But I find that kind of confusing, right? Because we said that the person on the ground measures the proper time for the trip, um, but because we have to do this convoluted thinking, because the pilot's not in an inertial reference frame, what instead we're going to do is we're going to use this, and we're going to say, I'm going to use this equation to find pilot measures ticks on their watch lasting one second. The observer on the ground is going to find them lasting longer. All right, then once we know how long the ticks last on their watch, we can do this. We can say the time measured by the pilot is just going to be the number of ticks times one second, right? Okay, but um, the number of ticks, the number of ticks is just going to be equal to the time measured by the pilot divided by one second, right? Oh, that's redundant. We just solved this equation. That doesn't get us anywhere. But I can also think of it this way. It's the time measured by the person on the ground divided by the time the person on the ground measures between ticks for the watch on the pilot's wrist. So we'll call that delta t, all right? So the pilot measures a time between ticks of one second, but the person on the ground measures a time dilated time between the ticks, which is going to be longer. So the person on the ground, is they watch the pilot's watch for this amount of time, but it only ticks this often. So if we divide those two, we get the number of ticks, all right? But I can rewrite this. The time for a tick, as measured by someone on the ground, is just gamma times the proper time, which is the time measured by the pilot. And the time measured by the pilot for ticks on their watch is just one second. So gamma times one second. So there we go. So the time measured by the pilot is just n times one second, but n is just the time measured on the ground divided by gamma times one second. 
And then we multiply that by one second. Number of ticks times one second, that's the time measured by the pilot. Those cancel out, and what have we got? P ground divided by gamma. So if I pull gamma to the other side, it looks like, oh, what the pilot is measuring is the proper time. That's kind of weird, right? Because the pilot doesn't measure the proper time for the journey, but they do measure the proper time for ticks on their watch, and we can't do anything in the pilot's reference frame because it's not an inertial frame, all right? Other than the, the ticks on the watch because they happen before the pilot has had time to turn around, go around the Earth and uh, change the reference frame. All right, so um, here we go. We're gonna find the time measured by the pilot and uh, gamma, one over gamma is just the square root of one minus v squared over c squared, and then we have the time measured by the ground, which is 24 hours, we said, right? We have the same problem we had in the last problem. It's the same v, so v over c squared is gonna be really small compared to one. So we will do our approximation once again, and we'll find then that t pilot is really darn, this is a really good approximation because v is really small compared to c, but this will be approximately equal to one minus one half v squared over c squared, right? So I just did the Taylor series expansion of this and kept the first two terms, and then I multiply that by v ground. But what we wanted was the difference in time. So let's subtract, let's subtract v ground from both sides, or t ground from both sides. When I do that, that'll get rid of this one right here, and I just, I'm left with negative one half v squared over c squared t ground. Now, this is negative, that means the pilot measures a shorter time. That's what we decided, because the ticks on their watch are shorter in the pilot's frame than in the person on the ground's frame. But now we can just go ahead and plug this into our calculator. We've got negative 0.5 times V over C is 464 divided by 2.22, 2.9979 times 10 to the 8. Square that. And then I'm going to multiply this by the time measured on the ground, which is 24 hours. And there we go. That's a very small number of hours. Why don't we multiply by 60 to get minutes? or not if the computer won't let me, there we go. And then 60 again to get seconds, and so there it is. It's negative 1.03 times to the minus seven, or negative 103 nanoseconds. So they fly for a day, our watches will disagree by 103 nanoseconds, assuming our watches are perfect. There you go, that's kind of a crazy problem, and I hope you can wrap your mind around it. A um, lot of thinking, um, how to set it up, but you, you need to know how to do this to do the homework and do the exam. So if you don't get this, go over it again. Still don't get it, come and talk to me.